as you say, Wicca was well, um, was the one who encouraged uh, Steve the Shazer to go on with his ideas, and I think it's it's very um, it, it's great, simply great that um, he continued to support him. Uh, even if uh, Steve starting to started to develop different ideas, but as far as we know, the miracle lady uh, is in Sokimberg, which yeah. used the miracle question for the very first time and yeah. gave great pragmatical contributions to oh. solution focus brief therapy. So, what do you think is the most important one? What, what do you think is the most important contribution that Kimberg? Uh, gave to uh, well, I, therapy. I was fortunate that I got to know Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg pretty well. Yeah. You know, they were married as well as colleagues. Uh, I sp and I, I wrote papers with both of them. We visited in one another's homes. We once spent a week together in Japan, and I liked them both very much. They were very different people. Steve was an introverted minimalist. Okay. He would talk very little. He sometimes seemed to be looking at things like he was from another planet. Mm -hmm. He was kind of, and so he could see things very clearly. He was also an excellent cook. He played the saxophone. He loved baseball and particularly the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, and he loved uh, Sherlock Holmes mysteries. In fact, Steve himself was a solution detective, if you will. <laughs> So Insu, though, was much more warm and vivacious. Uh, she liked to joke. Um, I used to call her my soul sister. She was born in Seoul, Korea. But Seoul, S-O-U-L, like a soul sister, you know, they're close. And we would send funny emails back and forth, things like that. And I was very sad when they passed away. Yeah. First Steve died uh, in 2005, and then within a year or so, Insu passed away also. Uh, by the way, you mentioned we were talking talking before, uh, the folks at Brief, the Brief Therapy Practice in Milwaukee, in, um, in London, uh, uh, Chris Iveson, Harvey Radner, Evan George, are, in my humble opinion, the keepers of the flame. They are the best proponents of solution-focused Brief Therapy, and I'm sure Steve and Insu would be very pleased to see how they have refined it. Yeah. Even before the miracle question, now I'll get right to your, your question. Even before the miracle question, Alfred Adler in the 1930s talked about, if I waved a magic wand, what would be different? Yeah. So he's asking sort of a miracle question before the miracle question. Yeah. But here is the story about the miracle question. It's in my book. Yeah. It's in a footnote. I will read it to you. Yeah, so you'll have you. it. Thank you. In their book, The Miracle Method, Scott Miller and Insu Berg in 1995, on page 37, <laughs> recount the origins of the miracle question, which has come to be a signature characteristic of solution-focused therapy. They wrote, a woman called us in 1984 for an appointment demanding that she be seen that day because it was an emergency. She began sobbing as she told the receptionist how her husband's drinking was out of control and that he had even been violent toward her. As the client entered the therapist's office and began to sit down, the client said, my problem is so serious that it would take a miracle to solve it. The therapist, Insu, simply following the client's lead, said, well, suppose one happened. What would happen if a miracle happened? Immediately, the client began to describe what she wanted to be different about the situation that was troubling her. As she described what she wanted in more detail, a smile began to creep into her face and the tone of her voice became more hopeful. As she stood to leave the office, she told the therapist that she was feeling much better. The following week, she returned and she reported that she had turned that feeling to some small but significant changes in her life and in her marriage. Yeah. So a, a client or a patient says, I need a miracle. And they say, okay, and if one happened, what would that be like? Suppose tonight while you're sleeping, a miracle occurred. And when you woke in the morning, the problem you came to see me about is just gone. What What would that look like? What would you notice? What would your partner notice? What would, your children, what would happen next? So it's a shift from problem talk to solution talk. It's uh, um, nowadays that the, the guys in London might say, uh, Harvey and, and Chris, uh, 
And Evan, they might say, what are your best hopes for today's meeting? They might not even ask the miracle question, but there's something about the miracle. It captures your imagination. A miracle happens. What would that look like? Uh, um, Steve and Insu were, uh, they loved one another. They were a team. They were a couple. Uh, they were partners in life and in their work. Uh, I think that Insu, because she was so much warmer, and I, I use the word vivacious, lively and energetic, uh, I think she showed that there were different ways that one could do solution-focused therapy, mm. where Steve could be very dry and direct. He was like the Zen master, only asking Steve the right question. And for some people, that worked. But Vince would have this twinkle in her eye and she, the way she would talk. Wow, you did that? Really? <laughs> uh, Steve, Steve wrote about Insu that Insu had... Um, the persona of Insu the incredulous. Wow, how did you do that? Just like he, he said, John Weakland had the persona of uh, Weakland the dense, like the dummy, uh, the, the master of one dumb. Oh, help me understand, how would that work? And he was like Columbo, the yeah, detective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even, though, even though they were both brilliantly smart, not dense and not dumb and anything like that, but they found different ways of bringing out the best in people. So, um, you know, when you see the books, it's the Shazer 82, the Shazer 85, the Shazer 91, the Shazer uh, 88, 91, et cetera, et cetera. And there are also articles by the two of them. And Insu wrote several books, too, oftentimes a uh, co-author. I'm very proud to say that Insu and I wrote a, a very good paper together on couples therapy. And, uh, and I did a couple of interviews with them. Uh, but they were... Um, they were part of the great movement that Erickson started yeah. of looking for people, looking at people as though they were capable and strong. And the therapist's job is to find out what is right instead of to find out what is wrong. And once you find out what's right or good or healthy or functional or adaptive or smart or useful, how to get the person to activate that, how to get them to apply it. Uh, Erickson called it um, he had some fancy name for it, but uh, uh, I forget what it is now, but cross cross situational learning or something like that, how to transfer it over, how to generalize it. Uh, uh, Steve and Insu, in their very different ways, uh, would... Uh, would do the same thing. They would keep asking people questions. Yeah. There's a wonderful videotape of Insu with this couple called Irreconcilable Differences. It's a beautiful videotape. Yeah. I show in seminars. Uh, and how the patients are presenting problems and they have some good things going. And she is just a master of not getting caught up in the problem, but finding out, oh, you love him. Does he know that? Oh, how did you do that? Of bringing out the best people where most of us would get sucked into going for the problems. She doesn't get into the problems. She keeps her sail out of their wind, unless it's blowing where they really want to go. Uh, so she's one of the underappreciated. Steve was much more the, uh, Insu was very smart. I don't mean to say yeah, anything yeah, wrong. Yeah. Steve was much more the intellectual. Mm -hmm. Steve mm -hmm. would discuss Wittgenstein mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and, and German philosophers and, you know, and Insu was more uh, warm and sort of direct. And, and Steve gave it sort of the intellectual, um, philosophical background much, yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. That's great. And uh, I'm a little... Um, um, I envy that you uh, knew both of them, okay. Uh, yeah. But I know you, and I'm lucky for that. You <laughs> know, the way I got to first meet them, in 1988, uh -huh. there was the first brief therapy conference held in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. And I was standing in the lobby at the hotel talking to Moshe Talmun, my friend Moshe Talmun, and Steve DeShazer came walking in. And Steve and Moshe said, oh, let me introduce you to DeShazer. Uh, Moshe had recently gone to Milwaukee to 
to study to go to a seminar or something. I'm not sure what the details were. So I met Steve and Insu and Yvonne Dolan, and then I said, "Oh, we're going to have a party at my house later in the week. Could you come?" And Steve said yes, and he said, and so and he pointed about five or six people. He said he invited them all to the party. The party got much bigger. Yeah. Sudden. And uh, there are other people. Uh, Mary and Bob Goulding were there. A man named Hans Strupp was there. Nick Cummings came to visit. There was a, and I realized like the history of brief therapy is in my living room. This is very exciting. <laughs> That's exciting. So great. Uh, first, I, I knew of them, but I had not really studied their work in detail. And then I took a seminar with Scott Miller. Yeah. Uh, Scott Miller came. Uh, he was on a speaking to her and he came and he gave a one day workshop I took and he got me really excited about solution focused therapy and then I got very interested and then I wrote to Steve and I said could I come and interview you and then, and then we got to know one another more and more and more.